Hawaii, then? From Hawaii, the big island of Hawaii and Kailua Kona. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, can you start just by telling me how you got into the 10th round division, like your interests? Yeah, uh, actually I can kind of came in the back door. Uh, I had uh, gone to uh, Fort Leonard Wood for engineer training, uh, intending trying to get into the camouflage outfit, so I knew that they were the engineers. After basic engineering training at Fort, Len uh, Fort uh, Leonard Wood, I was sent to a topographic, engineering topographic outfit in West Virginia, and they were on maneuvers. I had had some, done some survey work with the mine people and so on, so it was on my card. So that's what I ended up doing in the winter in West Virginia. That was miserable. And so I said, I want to go to the ski troops. <laughs> so I put in for a transfer and it came through. I couldn't believe it because the ski troops were so elite. And I had done some skiing, of course. I had skiing in my background. So I got to Camp Hale uh, the last winter that they were there. And so I didn't have any of the initial instruction or any of the real basic mountaineering training until I got there for that last winter, which did include the D-series. And of course, we're all quite proud of the fact that we survived the, the D-series. <laughs> so uh, that's how I happened to get in. And I happened to get be assigned to the S2 section of the engineers in headquarters, which had a, on the, on the, what do you call it, the table of organization, a camouflage sergeant. So I was, I wasn't that, but I assisted and that's how I happened to be in there. Okay, so your rank was a sergeant? Then? No, I, I was a T5 uh, at Hale. I came out a staff sergeant, but uh, a T5 while I was in, the, uh, through, the, or, through the war. Okay, um, can you describe the D-series, what it was like? Oh, everybody has their own uh, experiences of it. Um, Easter Sunday morning, and uh, I imagine a number of the guys have said this, Easter Sunday morning, it was 30 below zero. We had, there were two men to a tent, and they were the old heavy rubber-coated uh, canvas tents. They weighed a ton. And uh, you had the Blue Army and the Red Army, and of course, uh, our job was to, uh, as far as the engineers were concerned, was to be sure the roads were all right, where they could take the vehicles and do the, some of the reconnaissance on skis in order to determine not necessarily where the, in, where the enemy was, but for engineering, maybe where they had made uh, 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 simulated mines and uh, things like that. So that was part of our job. And it was cold and miserable, and uh, uh, the food was bad. I mean, not bad, but uh, sparse. You know, we had we had uh, mountain K rations, that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, we and the engineers really didn't have it so bad. We did have. I think we had a weasels. Uh, uh, I think we had a weasel assigned to us. And if anybody else has talked about the weasels, why they know about the tracks coming off. In fact, there's a little one down there, the T-15 is on display, not the big one, the big one. But uh, that's how, uh, how we operated. It was, it was a, what was it, I don't know how long, I think it was three weeks, it seemed like a year, you know. But it was cold and miserable and you were wet, your socks were wet at night and, uh, and, uh, and uh, it, it was, it's pretty good, and we had on a lot of. Uh, they were still testing some um, winter clothing, snow clothing, and uh, things like that. So we were kind of experimenting with some of the uh, equipment. How did you guys get through the night during the D series? Because it was so cold. You know, the tents were uh, the the coldest place to be because your moisture. You close up your tent, and the moisture would form on the inside of the tent, and of course it became frost, and we, the tents were very small, and if you moved, all that frost came down on you. <laughs> but we did have the heavy uh, mountain sleeping bags. And uh, so, but we ended up uh, digging snow caves, or snow holes at least, 
laying the the uh, bags down in in there, and if it snowed on you, okay, you know, you had you pulled a tarp that you tent over you or something is much much more better than the, uh, uh, the tent in many respects. So uh, uh, yeah, it was it was, uh, and we'd put our uh, we had the big great big mountain boots, and uh, we'd take those off and shove them down in the bottom of the of the sleeping bag to keep get them keep them warmer than they would be outside, you know, and then the, the socks if they were wet our extra pair of socks we'd put under our armpits, <laughs> and they would hopefully be dry in the morning. <laughs> So uh, those are those are some. We get up real early. We had one. Uh, we had a small section. Uh, the S two section was probably eight to ten guys. A very small section. And uh, we had one big tall kid who was always goofing off. Always just never got with it. He, you know, he was a kind of uncoordinated sort of person. And you get up very early, very dark, of course. And our sergeant was uh, Sergeant Groff, and he was he, he was what he said. What he was an old army man. So when he in the morning when he tried to line up and he'd find us, you know, he said, "Where the I don't know whether you can use this or not, but where the hell is Sedgwick?" <laughs> so in order to find him, he'd go along and he'd look at the top of the boots because the kid was real tall and he couldn't pull his pants down. We had straps under our uh, pants, you know. And he couldn't, they were too short for him. So they're always sticking out of the boots. And he'd go along and look there to, see, to find Sedgwick. <laughs> so, you know, those are the funny things you remember. Um, so what did you do? You talked about finding mines in the B-series. Uh, well, uh, simulated. Line, yeah. They laid simulated mine fields. Mm -hmm. And then we would have to uh, uh, put the word out to the infantry where they were. Part of the S2 job was to take care of mapping, maps, which in Italy, the training transferred to the present map that they had, which was great because they were wonderful maps, beautiful maps. But there we were using our topographic aerial uh, uh, things, and we did have, we did have some uh, top, uh, USGS topographic maps, and so we would Pass that information out to the infantry on where the simulated mines were in our, for our army. And that then transferred to the same kind of thing overseas. So uh, that was part of our job. Yeah, did you practice building bridges at all? Did, did I? Yeah. At Fort Leonard Wood, we used to build wooden bridges with great big oak logs. And that, that was a tough, tough basic training because it was basic engineering plus the infantry training. So it was kind of pretty tough, and it was the middle of summer, and uh, it was pretty warm. But uh, up there, uh, they did, the line companies did build some, uh, I don't think they built any vehicle bridges, but I think they built some footbridges. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure. I can't give you an accurate uh, on that. Oh sure, sure, sure. No, the D series pulled us together. I mean, because everybody, I'm sure, all the interviews said the D series. If you got through that, you survived the D series. You know, many of them said that they, the D series was more difficult than, than Italy. <laughs> so it was a tough go. It was, but it was tough training. It was good, good for us. You know. So after Camp Hale, where did you go? We were transferred down to Camp Swift, the, yeah, Camp Swift in Texas near Austin. And they pulled us out of, out of hail and right in the springtime when everything were just, the, the bushes along the creek were budding, you know. <laughs> we went down to Camp Hale, to uh, Camp Swift, and it was, it was, it was terrible. That was, they didn't know, see, they didn't know what to do with the 10th Mountain. We were trained specifically, and they didn't have a place for us. They, when I say they, the, the powers. And so they said, well, we'll give them flatland training. So they took us down there, and we had mules down there. And uh, I didn't, we, uh, on some of the, like the forced marches, you were assigned a mule. 
Well, we had heavy packs, and I can't remember the exact degrees, but I'm sure it was over 100. And so even though we were pretty tough coming from that training, it just all perspiration. <laughs> you come. I'd never experienced anything like that. You'd come in at night and, uh, you know, lay down on your cot and it was just like laying in the bathtub. <laughs> it was very, very tough flatland training, and especially with the mules because mules were not, uh, uh, <laughs> they didn't cooperate well. So it, along with the time that you're trying to make, you know, in the heat and everything, you've got this mule behind you that you're trying to pull. And uh, I never fell out of any anything up to that time. But I, on one one of the marches down there, I said, I just can't do it. And I, I, I think I was carrying a radio at the time, you know, a big, heavy radio, I think, along with the pack and the mule and everything. I said, I just can't. And I went and sat down. Well, fortunately, uh, they took a break right at that time. But if not, it would have been a serious thing because, you know, if you fell out, why? Uh, there were some demerits, <laughs> but it was uh, it was tough. That fact, we lost mules in the, in the river down there. Uh, we built the, the another engineering company, a heavier engineer. See, we were like we we didn't have heavy equipment, real heavy equipment. So an, another engineering company had built a ponton bridge across the river. We got to camp one night and tied up the mules on the line. And mules uh, that go in packs, if you know anything about them, they'll have, they'll have a bell mule who's a, a leader, and the others will follow where that bell is. Well, we tied them up uh, to a line that, I think it was at night, and uh, uh, the bell mule got away from us and started across the bridge, and after they had been unpacked, well, some of them, they still had their um, artillery racks on, the backpacks, the form, the shape, you know, and uh, they uh, 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 it got on the bridge, the Ponton Bridge, and it tipped over, and the bell, the bell mule went over, and they all followed. Bell. We lost about I don't know seven or eight mules. Just you watched them as they rolled over. You know you couldn't do a thing about it. So the next day, uh, they were going around assigning details for finding the dead mules, and either I think they were burning them. So everybody got out of the way when <laughs> that detail came around. Nobody wanted that detail. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, it was tough. It, it was that flatland plus the mountain. I mean, I really uh, think added to the. Even though we all hated it, it was part of the tough part of the of our training. And then we got the call, of course, to ship overseas. They finally found uh, General Clark. Mark Clark uh, felt that he needed a mountain group to uh, help in the mountains. Maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but the uh, Allies had, I think the Germans held it for against four uh, Allied uh, attempts, I think, before that time. And so uh, that's when I guess he felt he needed us. Did you know you were going to Italy when you were shipped out, or was it just a surprise where you went? Yes, because we shipped out later than the first group went over before the end of the year. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, what we called latrine rumors got back to us that that's, that's where they were going. And we, uh, yes, we knew where we were going, but we didn't know anything about it or why, you know. At, down at my level, uh, I didn't, didn't, we didn't have any idea what it was. Now the boat trip over, if you want to hear about that, that's another horror story, I'll tell you. We were stacked, I don't know, down, I, would, I forget whether we were three or four holes down, but the, you had about this, this much space between you, your nose and the guy, uh, the hammock, or the uh, cot above you. There must have been six, about four or five deep or something like that. And it was the middle of winter, and uh, the North Atlantic, and uh, it took us 13 days, I think it was 13 days to go because they were zigzagging to avoid the submarines. And uh, I would say that 80% of our guys were sick, and they were sick. 
And some of them couldn't even get out of the, out of the uh, their cot, you know, to go eat. And they were forcing them to go, and they'd be standing in line. I know this isn't very nice to talk about, but they'd be standing in line with their helmets, you know. And uh, it, it was a rough crossing, and we couldn't go up up. It was all uh, blackout, of course. We couldn't go up on deck, and uh, for maybe during the day, we'd go up for just a few minutes. It was it was not a good experience the going the trip trip over. In fact, it was uh, that rather uh, sickening. <laughs> Very sickening. I, w I, was, I was sick some of the time, but some of those poor guys, I felt so sorry for them. They, do, they were green from the time we left till we got there. <laughs> so that was quite an experience. Yeah, uh, when you got to Italy, um, can you describe some of your first impressions of Italy? We landed at Naples in the bay, and there were, uh, I, I don't know how many boats had been sunk there, and the hulls were still in the bay, you know, sticking up out of the water. And we embarked uh, and got in line, and we had uh, had our rucksacks and, and our big bags had been shipped. And we marched through the streets of Naples, and I remember my captain of the S-2 had a uh, map pack, uh, a map uh, uh, carry a Mac folder on the back of his uh, pack, and uh, right out in the street, he may, they they stole it. He never did know who when it went, because the kids were all over and the people, you know, and so on. But that was one thing; you had to be very careful. We got to the railroad yard, and they had the old what in World War One they called the forty and eight box cars. And we got there, and we were sitting there, and the kids, the Neapolitan kids, of course, they were starving, and they were thieving, uh, you know, stealing things. And I remember that the MPs had dogs, and they'd, they'd turn the dogs on the kids to keep them from getting close to the train or getting close to us or something, you know. They just, I imagine every day that they were doing that, they just got, could control them. So anyway, then it uh, we took us about I uh, can't remember probably two days to get up to Pisa, where we were on the King Victor Emmanuel's uh, grounds, where the uh, staging area was. We set up tents, and I can't remember how long we were there. We weren't there probably oh less than a week or less than a week, and. Uh, this was uh, back of the front lines, of course. And then we were sent up, our particular unit, the engineers and some others were sent up to some little towns. One of them was Maresca, and um, uh, the other one was Campo Tesoro. Campo Tesoro. And that was a bigger town, and they had some kind of a factory there where they did metal work and things like that. But our little town of Maresca, where we were billeted, we were billeted in a house with a family underneath. And uh, my sergeant, who was here today, Sergeant Curry, uh, and I were billeted together, and it was cold. They, of course, they had no heat, and it was cold in those old stone houses. And uh, uh, but they did. Uh, the, the people were nice, nice family. They had a little boy, and. Uh, we were there when we set up an office, an engineer's S2 office in uh, one of the, um, well, I guess it was somebody's house down the street. It wasn't in the same house. So that's where we worked out of while we were getting ready for the, for the push. And in order to, uh, uh, for them to get ready, we had to get as much uh, intelligence work on engineering, on the roads, and on the um, bridges, and anything that will be affected, because in addition to the troops going up, of course, they have to have the trucks going, and so what bridges were out. And so the line companies were busy, and we were busy assembling the, the uh, information. And uh, you know, uh, if you get anybody from, well, Company D of the engineers, it, it, it might, one of the guys is here, uh, uh, Anyway, he was uh, with uh, uh, Captain Noggle, who was ca uh, head of the uh, 
Lieutenant Noggle at that time, head of Company D. Now, Company D was the company that built the aerial tramway up Reaver Ridge. Well, in order for do, him to do that, they had rec reconned, uh, several groups uh, had reconned the slopes. And I remember I drew the profile for the tram. Uh, I drew, did an, a profile and, and made the tram uh, where, where it might be put. So that was my little contribution to the building of the tram. I, the line companies did the, did the heavy work. But if you've heard anything about the tram, they were able to send up supplies. But the main thing was, was bringing the wounded off of Tree Reaver Ridge, which took, which took only, uh, I don't know, 30 minutes or 20 minutes, whereas it would have been, you know, two days trying to get, get them down on mules or stretchers and things, because that's a steep. Did you see the movie last night, The Last Ridge? Well, the steepness of the slope was, it was tremendous, because these guys had climbed it at night and they had reconned it, you know, but it was, it was a tough go for them. As I say, you know, my job was backing, helping back, and give them the information. That was what our job was. We weren't up there when it happened, but uh, we went up uh, the day after they took Belvedere, and I, that was my first uh, introduction to a, a war zone to see the dead Germans and the dead Americans. And it was cold. And of course, they were frozen in, in, in rigor mortis anyway. But it was, it was, uh, you know, you, you just thank God that that you weren't there and had to be with them. I admire the the, the guys that did Reaver Ridge and Belvedere, and just tremendous, tremendous job. Yeah. Um, what did you guys do while you were waiting for the for the attack? Uh, what did you do in your leisure time? Well, um, it, primarily it was at night, so we walked down the road to a, um, uh, all the pubs were, uh, or, well, I shouldn't call them pubs, the little taverns and things, there was, in town had been blown, the stores were all, you know, nothing was being served. We walked down to a particular house that we found, a family's kitchen. And gradually the word got around to go there, and so we sat around in those, in, with this family, and uh, um, had wine, and uh, I can remember uh, uh, my sergeant and I, Curry, I don't know if you'll like me saying this, but remember uh, climbing back, it was probably, oh, half a mile, three-quarter mile up the hill to our billet, and uh, we got pretty sloshed one night, and poor, uh, we, well, by the time we got, a, got home, we weren't able to even take off our boots, <laughs> fell into bed. <laughs> <laughs> and besides the attraction of the wine down there, the the, uh, the family had a nice, beautiful young daughter, <laughs> which, which she thought my sergeant was the greatest guy in the world. <laughs> so that did, that helped our uh, at the hospitality. They're very wonderful people. Of course, they had very little to eat, but they invited us to an anniversary party, an anniversary dinner, just he and I. Uh, I guess the daughter liked uh, liked my sergeant so well. <laughs> But uh, they had just, they had pieces of meat, and you know, I'm sure they did, they were sharing things that they had very little of. But I can remember that was my first taste of the Marsala liqueur. It's a very heavy, sweet, after-dinner drink. Man, it was good. <laughs> so that was what we did. We it really wasn't, uh, I, I would guess we were there, must have been there at least Ten days or two weeks in that before the real push before we had to move on. Yeah. Um, what did you guys do to help each other cope after the loss of some men on River Ridge and Belvedere, or during throughout your whole campaign? What did you guys do? Well, um, I don't know. Uh, you know, we were in uh, on our reconnaissance work. What we did would. We'd be, we had two jeeps to the section, so we were we had transportation, and there was no skiing at that time. Of course, there was no, but um, we were able to, you know, we had certain places on the map that we went to look at. For instance, like bridge blows or something, and uh, then we had uh, we kept what we called a situation map, which had all the blows and had the minefields laid out. We knew from. Uh, uh, reports from the um, Italians 
and various people where the minefields were, or supposedly we did, and, and sometimes, the, of course, they gave us the wrong information, some of them. But anyway, uh, a very few of our guys uh, had any real, uh, of, of my section, had any real problems. They were there was a little jeep driver who uh, was, was, he and my captain were uh, uh, blown up, and my captain went to the hospital for a while. He was trapped on his back, but the jeep driver escaped, but he came back. He was kind of a little naive uh, young fellow, and he was he was uh, just shaking. I mean, and uh, it, we were sitting around at night for a long time. At, uh, our, well, we have a camp stove in the in the pyramidal tent, and uh, if somebody scratched the canvas uh, or opened the flap, you know, with the scratching noise, he'd swear it was a shell coming in, and he'd dive under. He he was pretty well shaken up from that experience, which I I can understand. But actually, our section, oh, we got in some artillery barrages, but we were usually able to uh, find a hole or find a uh, blown building or something like that, you know. So as far as the, uh, our experience as compared to the infantry of having your buddy shot next to you, you know, we didn't have that. I didn't, never experienced that. We didn't in our, in our section. But uh, we had some funny experiences, though. Uh, we uh, dived into a wrecked building on one of the artillery barrages. I guess they could either see us or else the road was under, uh, was targeted in. And um, it was all dirt, kind of the basement sort of a place. And uh, my sergeant and I were uh, wondering, here's some stuff that was kind of wrapped up in packages. We opened it up and here's this beautiful leather, just the, the, the pure tanned leather and they were bales of it. So, um, you know, we've been loot, looting uh, sergeant, sergeants, or looting uh, in, uh, soldiers. Uh, we each took a load of it, and I don't know what we did. I think we finally sold it in Florence or some place to, because, you know, old leather works over there, but it was beautiful stuff. And then another time, uh, I was in, uh, on reconnaissance, and they had left me in the Jeep while they went in, uh, he and when the, our lieutenants went into this town. Well, we had a lieutenant with us. On, it, it was Fritz Benedict, and Fritz is one of the uh, people of, that really started Aspen after the war. He was an architect. He was an older guy. He had, he had studied with Frank Lloyd Wright and so on. But he and um, Curry had gone, went in, uh, Sergeant Curry, and uh, I'm in the Jeep, and here come these, and we, they, I saw this big bombardment going into the town. I thought, boy, you know, but I waited there, and here they come on bicycles, <laughs> coming back on bicycles out of this bomb, bomb town. I don't know where they're getting there. <laughs> so uh, that was one of the experiences. Okay, so um, after Riva Ridge and Belvedere, where did you guys go next? Well, uh, I can't remember the towns and the maps, you know, uh, not having them right in front of us. Um, but, of course, the Long Ridge, Della Terraccio, and on down. It wasn't just this mountain here and then the Pull Valley. It was this Long Ridge of Della Terraccio and uh, little towns of Costaldeana and, and um, you, they'll hear these names. I, I can't remember that where we really, the names of the towns. Uh, most of the time, <coughs> When we moved, we had to move an office. We had to move all our equipment. So we did have a truck. One time, one on one of those moves down before the Pole poor Valley, <coughs> pardon me, we got in pretty late at night. <coughs> and the order was to dig a foxhole. Don't, you know, don't go inside. Don't. Because there were stone buildings, pardon me, <clears throat> I'm sorry, you want to cut it? A minute. <clears throat> I... This will be okay in a minute. I use Fisherman's Friends. If you ever have a throat uh, congestion, Fisherman's Friends, they taste terrible. 
Mm. Boy, they do the job. Oh, yeah? yeah, the original. Get the original. They don't get the flavored one. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so I, I don't, can't remember the names of the towns or the places, but as we went down the fighting, you know, and, and we were, see, one of our jobs was to supply maps to the whole division. And these beautiful, beautiful Italian maps were available to us. So it was, you know, wasn't like fighting in the South Pacific where you had nothing. And so the job was to get the one to two hundred thousand maps to the main headquarters. Then, as we moved into an area uh, which was top secret of where we were going next, we'd get this supply of maps, and they'd go to the hundred thousand, one to hundred thousand, one to fifty thousand, one to twenty-five thousand. And that would, they were distributed, we had different amounts, went to different units, different size units, but the fellows who were like the platoons and were really doing the um, patrol work and things like this, the infantry, they had these uh, one to 25,000 maps, which was a, didn't have any color on them, but every house, every well, every road, every ro uh, bend in the road, everything was there. So they were just so accurate and wonderful. Well, that was one of our jobs all the way down, was to keep them supplied with the advance where we were going. Because nobody really knew uh, the direction except the top people, you know. And one of our jobs was to either draw profiles where the line of sight, or they, they knew, we knew where the Germans were most of the time, and if they could see a certain road, we tried to avoid we, that. But there were some ways you could no, no way avoid uh, that. One of the places was Malandroni, Malandroni Bridge, and it was with the Bailey Bridge people, these are the heavier equipment, they'd put the bridge in after it was blown, and the next day they'd have to put another one in because they had it targeted in. So uh, all the way down there, there were a number of experiences with uh, billets and farms and families. The, place, the towns were decimated. Well, you've seen the pictures of them. They were just decimated. Anyway, we got to this one place. It was very late at night. And they said, don't, they've got this area spotted in. And, and we had been gone for 48 days, or 48 hours, pardon me. 48 hours without any sleep. We just kept moving. They kept moving and moving. So uh, we got set up, got the everything set up, and it was. Just, I was just dead tired. I climbed up in the attic, the upper part of this old stone house, with a wood beam farmhouse, and uh, got in a sleeping bag. And during the night, I kind of had this dream and of, of glass and and kind of you know something went on and everything. I woke up in the morning. And they had, uh, uh, we had an artillery barrage directly upon us. And I had been up there and the glass from the window had shattered and come over me. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, I don't know, we didn't have any, in oh, they did, they blew up the, uh, the kitchen. They blew up, the, I remember that, they blew up the kitchen. <laughs> and uh, so that put that out of commission for a while. But uh, that was a night that, you know, and then other nights we'd have to dig a, fo uh, a foxhole and uh, uh, stay there, but I was just too tired that night. And against orders, I climbed up there, <laughs> went to sleep. Didn't wake up at all. I <laughs> slept through the artillery barrage. <laughs> so, uh, what was that next question? Uh, what was the uh, you had asked about? Am I covering it okay? Yeah, oh, yeah all right. you're doing really well. Yeah. All right. Aside from that little experience, what was your uh, experience with the 88s? Some of the others? Yeah. Well, the, um, there were some incidents along several artillery barrages we were cut in. Oh, when we went to uh, Roca de Corneta, Roca de Corneta, I believe it was, uh, I got caught. Uh, it, it, it was a cliff with the villages around there. I got caught on the wrong side of a building. We were uh, making some, and uh, some machine guns had it in. So I dove into this uh, 
uh, a low doorway sort of thing, and it was pretty dark in there and everything. And I was, and I looked over, and here's this dead German sitting there, right next to me, <laughs> that had been caught by our guys. So that was one experience. I think the mo next major uh, things I remember was crossing the Po Valley, and you get to the, we got to the Po River, which then becomes a major terrain obstacle. We were moving so fast that the equipment to cross a river uh, had not arrived. Well, that part of our job, engineers, was to m either build the bridges or to take Ponton, take Ponton uh, boats across. Well, the boats were, you know, they're back in Florence or something like that because we're moving so fast. The story I hear is that, and Fred Noggle, who was, happened to run across a British outfit who had some assault boats, wooden assault boats in the in trucks, and he just commandeered the whole thing, they weren't going to let him have him. Well, that's what we had to take the troops across. And uh, <clears throat> you're on the flat in the Po River. The river's probably 200 yards wide, something like this. The bridge is, bridge is blown. The Germans had taken, they were using concrete ferries with planks, heavy planks on them to take their stuff off. So they're on the other side and we're here. The uh, uh, Colonel Parker, who was the uh, head of the engineers, grabbed a hold of me and said, we're going up, and he stood there on the bank to make the decision of whether we should try to go across or not. And I remember then we went back to the headquarters and decided, and the boats were brought up, and the next morning, we were all ready to go. We didn't try night crossing. And uh, these assault boats, and I don't know where they come from, the story uh, Fred tells is that he got them from the British, and they were small. Here's these guys out in the open. I'm in, they, they had dikes, you know, along the, the river, and I'm in a, 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 a foxhole part of the time, but part of my job was to go and form the platoons to move up as the boats were available. Well, I'm running back and forth and the artillery, the Germans, they're sitting over in the church tower, their observation uh, thing, and they, they could see everything we were doing. They had us zeroed in. And not only that, they were using air burst, where the, 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 the bomb bursts up here, so that if you're down in a foxhole, you can get it. So you've got to have your foxhole underneath. I mean, you've got to have a kind of a cave. So anyway, I, every now and then I'd hit that when the barrage just came in and I'd be, there and then finally my lieutenant grabbed me and he said come on we got to go across we got to see what's available what observation for engineer information and this was from benedict we went down to down to the bank down to the river we were up just a little ways and uh, they they really started loading us in so we dived into one of these concrete uh barges i guess you'd call it and it, up above us, it was down underneath, and up above was this heavy planking across it. And I sat there, and every time a shell came in, no matter how far away it was, it sounded like it was when it went off. It was right there in this concrete. You can imagine being in a uh, in a drum inside a drum. I don't know how long it went on, but that really got to me. And anyway, when it kind of let up, then we get out and we got into a boat, went across to the other side. And uh, uh, Benedict started uh, making some notes and things like this. And out of one of the uh, uh, places, one of the trenches, they were well fortified over there, well built in. This young kid, young German, came out and surrendered. And I told the Ben, I said, well, you know, what are we going to do? He said, well, he said, I, I think he's probably got some, some information, and since he's the first one we've seen as far as taking a prisoner, take him back over and take him back to, he to headquarters. So, okay. And he was scared to death, of course, a young kid. And uh, so we got in a boat, we came being back across under the artillery barrage, and, and we got the, to the other, to back to our side. 
and I'm marching the prisoner back, and the guys were coming forward, and they shoot the bastard, shoot the bastard, <laughs> and uh, you know, no way. But this artillery barrage come in, and he, uh, you know, he was terrified, of course, and so was I. But he dived into the foxhole, into one of the foxholes, and I dived in on top of him. And we laid there while the barrage came along, and when <clears throat> when I prodded him to get up, and I saw it, and he had it, he had a piece of shrapnel, right, which had gone right over my head into his back. <laughs> so, you know, uh, he was kind of like this, and I wasn't completely covering him, but it wasn't big enough. For, for, we were both like that. So I took him back, and uh, in the meantime, they had zeroed in on our headquarters. So it wasn't much better back there. You get in a room, and <laughs> I just turned him over to them. So, but that was the first prisoner that I know of taken back from that side of the pole. Well, from there on, it was a, it was a real race to uh, Lake Garda, and uh, Lake Garda is a long, thin lake, and it, along both sides of it, it has tunnels, you know, because it, it's got steep banks on either side, and we were going up the east side. And in order to, uh, some of the tunnels had been blown. So they thought, uh, they thought they, that rather than try to dig the tunnel out, that what we would do is to uh, build some bridges around it, we could, in some way. So they sent me back to a heavy, what a heavy bridge uh, company, uh, back in the back, in, uh, in the back. And I forget where it was, it wasn't Florence, it was, uh, some place closer than that. And by the time I got back then, why, they're in full force moving forward. They weren't waiting for it. So one of the tunnels uh, was completely blocked, and they managed to get the bull Our engineers went up and bulldozed enough to we could get through. And we found that they had tried to blow that one. I mean, uh, when we came, but it had blown uh, prematurely and uh, had uh, uh, killed a number of the German soldiers uh, in there. They didn't get out in time. And then one of the tunnels, they had the 88s, their 88 guns were sitting at the northern end of the lake, and they had these, zero, these uh, tunnels zeroed in, and instead of using them on a lobbing situation or high, they were shooting right, ac right across the lake at these tunnels and blasting, uh, you know, them, using them uh, kind of like a, a straight level uh, shot. So that was part of it. And then there's a lot of stories that I, uh, the, about that that I'm not in, involved in. A number of stories, the, the ducks uh, came along. For some reason we had ducks. One of them overturned. We lost 25 guys, I believe, on that one. Then Benedict has a story about he commandeered a, a, a sailboat in order to put a, an artillery piece on it. And uh, it got tied on, on out of balance, and it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> so, you know, we were doing everything we could to get, use the lake, and yet, when we were out on the lake, well, you're in full view. A beautiful spot, Lake Garda was wonderful. And I do have to tell you one thing, we had, they had been magnificent villas. Oh, if you've ever seen any pictures of them, and he, it's a beautiful lake. And uh, so one of our billeted places was one of these uh, elegant houses, which ha had been pretty well cleared out. And they had uh, olive groves and things like that. It was very nice. It was, you know, it was one of the few places you'd go into and feel like it was fairly elegant. So. Uh, one of the things I saw there was a little wooden, carved wooden shoe, very small, about this size, a mountain boot. And there was a little, uh, the upper part was carved out. And it had some writing on the bottom of it. It was just about this big, it wasn't very big at all. I thought, well, I make a good souvenir, I'm going to take that. So I did. Well, I had that little boot sitting around for years. and. On one of, on one of my uh, uh, trips back to Italy, one of the reunion trips, I got somebody to, f to find out uh, 
what that said on the bottom. It was kind of Italian script and it was written on this bottom of the sole boot. And so it had the name of the, um, I forget what he was, he was a medical, uh, an Italian doctor in the army. And he had given something to my dear wife or something like this, and he had put sweets in it. And I said, on the next trip over, I'm gonna find this guy if I can. Well, I did a lot of looking, I did a lot of research, went to city halls and went, you know, oh yeah, yeah, well he's now in Milan. And so we were going to depart, we, had, we were going to turn in a car, this is on one of our tours. My wife and I had rented a car. And uh, so I had written or phoned or something, I'd gotten a hold of him, he came down to the train station and he had been you know, he had been on, in on the uh, attack on uh, Ethiopia. He was a paratrooper, a doctor paratrooper. And he was so happy to see that little boot. <laughs> so I returned, I returned my loot <laughs> to them and my conscience felt better. <laughs> so that was one of the things. But, uh, you know, those are little side stories that we went into. But when you entered the war, did you think you would survive? You know, I really didn't think about it. You were living day to day. You were trying to do your job, and as far as the engineers and the job I had and everything, I really didn't. Even when we were on reconnaissance and under some other, I, the only place I was really scared was the Po River. That was when I was really scared. One of the times, oh, I was scared in the others, but that was something. And uh, so I, uh, I don't know, you just kind of, this is your job and you do it, and I know a lot, of, but that's, a, that's what I understand from a lot of guys, you know, it has to be done, and so you're here, that's your job. What were your feelings when the war ended, when you found out that the Germans had surrendered? Uh, we were at Lake Garda, uh, up at the town of Riva, Uh, we had, uh, well, I wouldn't say it was mixed emotions. It was just a, kind of an unbelievable situation. It's finally ended. I mean, we knew it was coming close. In fact, there had been rumors before that. You see, what happened on our end there was that this German general uh, surrendered before the official German surrender. So. His mountain, all of his troops uh, had been surrendered to us. And uh, uh, the actual day that that happened, that we, we, were, we were living in barracks uh, which had formerly been occupied by the Germans. They were big in the town of Riva. And when that, the actual day happened, of course, all the soldiers wanted to get drunk and everything. And so Captain Seaman said, told us, he said, okay, we're gonna, we had a very spacious office there, a room. And he said, we're not gonna go out and get dangerous or anything. He said, so we just locked the doors and he brought out his whiskey ration and we sat in that room and got drunk. The Colonel, Colonel Parker, Parker, or we heard somebody pounding on the door to get in and, uh, uh, this captain, we had a neat guy, he's here too. Captain Seaman, he said, go away, go away, go, you know, don't bother us. And this, he said, this is Colonel Parker, what are you doing in there? <laughs> so we had to, and he looked at it, he said, okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, the, so we stayed out of trouble. But the thing about it was that then the next day, this Lieutenant Benedict, Fritz Benedict, he was a, he was a character. He said, we're going to go up and see what it's all about. The Alps were right there, and if we had had to go into the Alps, we would have been slaughtered. Pillboxes, you know, and camouflaged and everything. And so we got in the Jeep, and we went north, and we came to this one first little town, and here's these German soldiers, and we weren't sure they knew the, that they had surrendered. <laughs> but here they are. And, they, you know, they're going like this as we go by. <laughs> and, you know, we really didn't. They still had their arms. Nobody was there to take it, take the arms. And we were probably, you know, among the first. Well, in some of those towns, we were the first. And 
Benedict loved this. He loved to drive into a town and the people would give him flowers and wine and so on like this. We got to this one little town and uh, 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 it, 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 they said, you know, where's the bar? And they wanted to give us the wine and everything. So we're there and the people are all around and this British woman comes up and she says, welcome to us and everything. Who, you know, they had been a couple of British ladies that had been there since the war. They were, I guess they were teaching and uh, they were very gracious and they took us up to their place, rather took us out of the saloon where all the, all the, the, the villagers were. And I looked down on our Jeep because nobody had been left with the Jeep and I was kind of watching it, you know, you knew, you weren't sure. And uh, this beautiful young girl is standing there. So I went down to see, you know, she was looking at the Jeep and, and I found out that she had been sent up there from Riva to stay away from the combat zone because they had expected Riva to be very heavily uh, bombed, I mean, lots of fighting. And uh, her father was a judge, had been a judge in the town and so on. So uh, 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 we went on, I found out, got her name, and then later on when we came back to Riva, uh, where we were stationed, why, uh, I went to see her family and see her, and so she, because she had come back then. That was a pleasant experience, nice, beautiful. I used to have to, we had a, we had a uh, Jeep driver by the name of Caledori, something like that. And he knew a little Italian. He, I think he was from New York or something. He knew a little, so I took him along to translate for me. <laughs> yeah, I still have pictures of her and I tried to find her when back on the reunion, but she had married and moved to Switzerland, so. That didn't work. <laughs> she was a nice young girl. And uh, so then we went on. We went into Austria, went up over the border. I don't think this was the same day. I think we went to several towns, and we didn't get very far because of all the celebration of the towns. You know, they were just overwhelming by this. And uh, but then later on, we took several trips, went up into Austria, and. Uh, had some good. Went to the Grossglockner, and we didn't ski on it. Some of the some of the uh, some of the uh, guys did though. Later on, they had they in fact they had races up there, on Grossglockner, which is a great big glacier up there. So it was uh, pretty exciting, you know, to be free of any oh I, well, you know pressures and tenseness and so on. Quite different. Um, no, I didn't. No. Mm -mm. Not not in a bad way. But uh, the return to civilian life, of course, was was. Uh, see what happened was when we came back. Well, in between, we were we were assigned part of our the division was assigned to the British Eighth Army over around Trieste. And so we were over there for. We didn't know what they were going to do. It was a very very touchy situation. And so we were there for, when was, the, when was the Japanese surrender? Anyway, we were there for maybe a month or so. And uh, while we were there, it was a very kind of a, just kind of watching each other sort of things. We went into Trieste. We all, each side had sidearms. We weren't supposed to carry any sidearms, the Americans. But here are the Yugoslavs, at that time Yugoslavia, and these peasants, uh, soldiers, were running around with submachine guns in the bars and the towns, you know, and we weren't supposed to. Well, we ignored that order, and we uh, all had uh, captured pistols or our own Army 45s, and, you know, the Eisenhower jackets were pretty tight, but we did make our own uh, holster, uh, arm under the arm holster, so that when you were like this, it was pretty well. But to go into town like Trieste, you know, or any of the small towns was kind of touchy. We had several firefights and things like that. Uh, they get trigger happy, both sides maybe. But uh, then uh, if you're getting to the end of the war, why 
as someone may have told you, the division was supposed to come in and have a furlough and then be shipped to Japan. Well, I was on the train when VE, VE Day, uh, or VJ Day happened. And uh, I was traveling from the East Coast back to Colorado. And so then the deactive, of course, guys were getting out on points, uh, the higher points, you know, they got out earlier and then they kept allowing you to get out with lower points and so on. But we were, I didn't have enough points to get out right away and they came back and uh, deactivated the 10th, just said there's no more 10th Mountain Division, sent us down to Camp Carson, which was Camp Carson at that time. And uh, so uh, my sergeant and I both didn't have enough points and all, we were the last ones of the headquarters nearly to get out because, uh, uh, and so he was assigned to, uh, uh, I was, I was then had the job of being supply sergeant and checking in everything and checking it back out. And uh, I forget what his job was, the overall, but there was no officers around. Then they sent us, they didn't know what to do with this. We still didn't have enough points, so they sent us down to Fort Campbell, Kentucky to an anti-tank situation. Well, there, they were sending everybody there just to build up enough points or get, until they get out. So that, that was only a few days, or probably a couple of weeks, you know. Um, is there anything that I haven't asked that you want to tell us? You've done a good, great job. Uh, I've kind of gone along in a chrono chronological situation and uh, recalled a lot of things. I talked about it various times, and I think we've probably used up our time. But uh, are we okay on that? I, I think it's pretty well covered. Okay. Mm -hmm. The reunions have been great. I mean, that's been part of my life. Not only, I mean, the, the association has been a big part of my life since the war, and uh, as I've told you previously. And uh, so I'm so happy to be here and be able to say farewell to a lot of the guys. Who, I won't see them again. They won't see me. Yeah. And you think that your training in the 10th Mountain Division has helped you with your life after? Oh, yes. Very much so, both from the standpoint of the comradeship of having been able to be at the reunion, being able to work with the association, and uh, contributing my talents to what they were doing because I took care of a lot of the early uh, chapter things. Since I've been over in Hawaii, I have not been able to do things, of course, but previous to that I was very active in it. And so those abilities as far as uh, promotion and publicity and uh, thing, organization and things like that has helped tremendously, yeah. I think uh, I, it was a good experience. You know, I talked to fellows from other outfits and uh, they had a tough time and there was no esprit de corps. So I think you, you've got to have that uh, uplift. Up, it, it was something which you wouldn't go, want to go through again, but you had to do it, and it's it's priceless. So. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. You're very good. <laughs>